They are children, children who have had run-ins with the law. They are at risk of committing violent crimes, and it's difficult to know what to do with them. Lena Ojemeri has developed a program that teaches kids how to think before they act. And she joins us now in studio with more on, what are you calling this program? It's called SNAP. And, and SNAP what's that stand, stand for? Stop Now and Plan. Stop Now and Plan. Yes. Let's go back and get some of the background into this. First of all, the Child Development Institute. Yes. What is that to be? So the with? Child Development Institute is a, a multi-service organization, including a children's mental health organization, and we provide services for children and families in the city of Toronto. So we have a early intervention stream, we have a family violence stream, we have a learning disability with mental health uh, challenges, and, and a healthy child development. I'm the director of scientific and program development, uh, and co-founder and developer of the SNAP program, and leading the SNAP strategy that we're trying to implement right across Canada right now. Okay, let's find out how big a problem this is. How many kids do you think under the age of 12 have tendencies towards solving problems violently? Good question, Steve. Um, we know that one out of every 10 children have serious uh, problems or serious disruptive behavior problems. In Canada, we know that 20% of our children have mental health issues and so one in ten have that more issues with regards to disruptive behavior problems so it's pretty serious so in Ontario alone that can translate into approximately 33,000 kids 33,000 kids who in are Ontario alone potential who if you don't get them before they take a step onto the dark side if I can put it that way that's a huge problem. It is. So they're on that serious pathway, which means they're having problems at home. They may be having problems at school. They're having problems in the community. They, uh, they're they coming to the attention of principals, teachers, uh, neighbors, uh, police officers, child welfare. So these are the kids I'm talking about are the most, I call them the top 2% in regards to severity. So when we assess these kids, we're looking at, you know, are they having problems in those multiple settings, but also are they having what we call externalizing behaviors, problems with their conduct, aggression, rule breaking. Those are the kids I think we need, all kids are need attention and yeah. all children deserve that attention and the right services. But what we're talking about is we call these kids the forgotten group a little bit. Well, we probably call them bad kids. And well, it's probably, I, <laughs> you know, and it's probably not their fault to begin with, right? Right. A lot of people will call them bad kids, but we don't like to call them. These are kids who are troubled. These are kids who need help, and these are kids who deserve the help. Um, so one of the responses that you have come up with is this SNAP program. Yes. Tell me, uh, for starters, what the program tries to do. So we started this program actually 30 years. So October 1st this year is their 30th anniversary. Happy we anniversary. started it. Thank you. So we started the SNAP program in 1985, in October of 1985, when the age of criminal responsibility in Canada was raised from 7 to 12. And so there was a bit of a gap and an unmet need for young kids in conflict with the law. And so given our, at the Child Development Institute, given our focus on kids with disruptive behavior problems, uh, and their families under the age of 12, that, that latency age, uh, middle years, 6 to 11, we were well positioned to develop that program, so we did. So when we think about the SNAP program, the whole premise of the SNAP program is teaching kids how to stop and think before they act, how to make better choices in the moment, because it's in that moment that they're going to make the wrong choice. And so just let me stop you there. Yes. Before that legislation came on the books, what happened to this cohort of kids? So kids as young as seven could be charged for a criminal offense. Really? And, so and that happened? And that happened. It happened. And they so didn't go to jail. They, no, but they were placed possibly in child welfare or they were placed in facilities where children shouldn't be placed because there were no specific programs for those uh, children. So what we did was we looked at the evidence. What was the best evidence out there? and pulled all together a cognitive behavioral intervention, which is what the SNAP program is, um, and looked at what researchers were saying, what was working, what wasn't working, and we created the SNAP program. And based how did the on kids that. come to your attention in the first place? So they come to us initially back in 1985, the first 10 years, 75% of the kids actually came from the police. And then in 1999, we did something in Toronto. We actually launched a police community referral protocol, almost like a triage to build a safety net to catch these kids earlier. We didn't want them to have to come through the police. We wanted them to come through the schools or through other children's mental health centers or community-based organizations um, that were knowledgeable that there was a program to meet the needs of mm -hmm. kids who were um, going down that slippery slope. So give me, for instance, here. Cops call you, say, we've got a kid who's done 
what, and therefore we think you need right. to intervene. So under the new legislation, and uh, that holds today under the Youth Criminal Justice Act, a police officer has two options. One, they can bring the child home, um, or they can, um, if they're deemed to be in need of protection, could bring them to the attention of child welfare. So a police officer calls, brings the child home, realizes, you know, they're Saying just... what? The, this child has done what? Uh, stealing, vandalism, break and enter, could be a lot of different things, uh, assault. And so Beating up fellow student, fellow that kind of thing? student, and we've had that. Mm -hmm. So what we, the police officer would say, with the parent's permission, I um, we're concerned about your child. We know there's a program here in the city of Toronto. Mm -hmm. We would like to refer your child to that. Are you okay with that? And sometimes the parent will, will say, make that call with the police officer there, or the parent will be given the information from a school, from a teacher, from another um, mental health provider. They'll call the one-stop number at the Child Development Institute, and within 24 to 48 hours, they would absolutely get a call back, and then they would get an intake. And the Is intake would determine whether the child was absolutely and their family appropriate for the service. Okay. Why, why wouldn't they be? There could be so many different reasons. A, they were too old. Um, B, they had some serious developmental issues that the program can't meet, and so we would connect them to an alternate or more appropriate service. But if they meet the criteria, which means they're between 6 and 11, they're having problems in multiple settings, they're aggressive, they um, are you know, engaging in activities that if they were 12, they could be charged, then the SNAP program is absolutely seems to be an appropriate program. Would there be children who come to your attention between the ages of 6 and 11 who are using weapons? There have been kids, um, and a weapon could be anything. So we're not only talking about a gun, because when you think about a gun, you think a weapon or a knife. It could be their fists, it could be a chair, it could be a pencil. There are different things that could be considered a weapon. Hmm. Is there a cost to the program? The program is actually free, uh, and that was thanks for the to the ministry, the government. Ministry of Children and Youth Services has been funding this program. Ontario government. Ontario government hmm. since 1985. And really delighted that um, just in June, uh, Minister Tracy McCharles um, announced the um, Enhanced Youth Action Plan and is investing about $55 million into the Youth Action Plan. And one of the things I'm extremely delighted about it is that they built a middle year strategy into the Youth Action Plan. And that's the middle years, the 6 to 11, mm. that I've always coined the forgotten group. So right. they're listening. So they're now built the strategy, and SNAP was actually identified mm. as a program for the middle years. Can you tell me, the, again, this is a bit of an old fogey question, so hang in there yeah. with me here. When I went to middle school, we got in fights all the time, yes. okay? I mean, that's how we settled our problems. You went out during recess and you squared off and you had a fist fight and, and then it was over and everybody was fine after that. Right. What's the difference between that and somebody who's really got a problem? It's a great question. Kids fight. Let's, let's, let's just get that on the table. Kids fight. It's normal child development. Kids fight in homes. Kids fight. Siblings fight. Um, but what ends up happening is when it becomes dangerous is when kids get hurt and the child also gets hurt. And so we have to kind of think about where is that threshold? Where does it become um, more serious versus just normal no, development? But Lena, we hurt each other. Yes. I, mean, I mean, Jeffrey Allen to this day tells me I saved his parents $5,000 in orthodontia bills because I punched him so hard in the teeth, his teeth went back into his mouth. Right. So people get hurt, but again, what's the difference between that kind of behavior, which was a kind of a, a one-off thing, and somebody who's on a track to become a criminal? So what we're saying is that these kids have multiple risk factors. They're not doing well at home. They're not doing well at school. They're not doing well in the community. They're failing at school. They are aggressive. They're antisocial. They're engaging in delinquent activities with a risk of uh, engaging in gang affiliation as well. So we have to try to, we know from all the research out there, we have to catch these kids early. Hmm. So early intervention is critical to get these kids off that uh, trajectory because what will happen, Steve, is these kids who are on that antisocial, we call this a serious violent and chronic pathway, those kids who start their f offending career under the age of 12 and f will most likely flip into the juvenile justice system. And then if they flip into the juvenile justice system at the age of 12, those kids are very, very likely to continue on that pathway hmm. without that help. So got to get them before you then. you got to get them before. And all the research points to the fact that the middle years is one of the best years to teach kids self-control, emotion regulation, and problem solving. Is therapy a part of this? Absolutely. So the SNAP program is considered an early intervention program. Um, but let me just clarify too, what we're finding is that not all kids going into the SNAP program have had 
uh, conflict with the law. They could be at risk of it, so maybe they're engaging in aggressive behavior, um, very anxious, rule breaking, but they haven't been caught or they haven't committed a serious uh, issue at this point. Mm -hmm. So you want to catch them early. You want to get these kids to be able to stop and think before they act so that they have an opportunity to succeed in school, at home, and in the community. They are hardwired at that age not to stop and think. They are hardwired at that age to just do yes. and worry about the consequences exactly. later. So I don't expect you to tell me, you know, hours and hours and hours of therapy and, and intervention right. in the next few minutes. Right. But give me a sense of, of how you teach a 10 year old to stop and think before hitting. Sure, but let me actually step one step back. Sure. What if I told you in 12 to 13 weeks we can actually change the children's thinking process? I would say I don't believe you, Lena. And that was done to the University of Toronto and the Hospital for Sick Children and that was under the direction of Mark Lewis and his team and Steve, Dr. Steve Woltering is continuing that study and Isabel Granite. How can you do all that if all of the other external factors in their life are still miserable. So let me tell you what we do. The very first piece is the SNAP program consists of a 12 to 13 week children's group. So the kids come for an hour and a half a week and at the time when the kids are coming to the children's SNAP group, whether it's a SNAP boys program or SNAP girls, their boys and girls are separated, separate. they're separate and they're put in a, a group according to age. So six, seven year olds, eight, nine year olds, 10 and 11 year olds developmentally. And at the same time, the parents are in a SNAP parent group. So not only is the child learning the SNAP strategies, and I'll tell you what that is in a second, the parents are also learning the SNAP strategy and effective child management strategies. Looking Which at, they probably need as much as the kids do. You know, parenting is hard. Let's be honest, I have two girls. I can't tell you how many times my girls will say, Mom, I think you need to read some of those books you're writing. <laughs> it, it's not easy. You buy a computer, you get a big manual. You get a child, it's what you know. And so it's really difficult, and I think we have to be fair to parents. Um, there's a lot going on in everybody's lives. So the, how, what we do is, when the children in their SNAP group, what we do is we actually teach them the SNAP strategy. And we actually get them to use it. And that's what it is. It's stop, nail, and plan. So I want you to think about a stoplight. A red light, a yellow light, a green light. When you are driving up, to, when you're coming up to a red light, what are you supposed to do? Hit the brakes. So hit the brakes. You're supposed to stop. When you come to a yellow light, what are you supposed to do? If you can stop safely, <laughs> you do. And right. if you can't, you go through right. it. Right. You hopefully pause and think and make <laughs> yeah. the right choice. And the green light is you can go. Mm. So think about snap that way. So something happens you take my ball it's my favorite ball it really pisses me off it makes me angry when you're angry what happens to you uh, you lose control of you your emotions control. you just want a green light what happens to your body we call those body cues what happens to your body gets tight your heart might be beating Tense up. your hands go yep. into fists i saw that your hands went into fists yep. those are what we call body cues that is what we happens at the red light and what we teach the kids is that immediately needs to trigger them to kind of stop because if they're in that aroused mode, do you think you're going to come up with a good plan? No. No. So in that moment, we say, what can you do to calm yourself down? They took your ball. It's making you red. You could feel your, your hot, your hands going to fist. What is something you could do to calm your body down in that moment? And what's the answer? What could you think? Uh, well, take a breath. Take a deep breath. Excellent, Steve. So that's what we would do. We say, you take a deep breath. So everybody, you know, take a deep breath. In through your nose, out through your mouth. It's like mindfulness a little bit. Mm -hmm. You kind of calm yourself down. What can you do with your hands? If you're a kid who likes to use his hands. Unclench. Unclench, put your hands down. Maybe in your pocket, but you have to be careful. If a police officer is right there and they say, you need to stop, is that a good time to put your hands in your pocket? Definitely not. Maybe definitely not, right? <laughs> so you have to be careful, mm -hmm. right? So take a deep breath, count to 10, you know, put my hands down. Those are calming effects. And then what are we saying to the kids is the yellow light. What do you think happens at that yellow light? Start thinking. You start thinking, exactly. That kid's doing that to piss me off. That's what we call a hard thought. And mm -hmm. if you keep thinking that, what's going to happen? It's going to drive your behavior. You're going to have to keep using those calming things. But we, we talk about, let's replace that hard thought with a cool thought. You know what? I'm just going to take a deep breath. I'm going to figure out how to get my ball back, and I'm going to get it back. Those are those what we call cool thoughts at the yellow light. And the green light has to make three things. It has to make your problem smaller instead of bigger make you feel okay how you handle the situation mm -hmm. and and the third thing is not hurt anyone yourself or anything so that's actually how the snap strategy works and that's what we're teaching so in 13 weeks we continually go through that scenario using different topics like group pressure stopping stealing 
joining in. Mm -hmm. All those different topics, and then the kids are actually videotaped. There's a discussion. There's a videotape. They watch themselves. So not only are they seeing somebody do it, they're watching somebody do it, and then they get to see themselves do it. Okay, this is where the skeptic comes in and says, that all sounds well and good on paper. Yes. But in real life, using your example, if somebody steals my favorite ball and starts running away with it, I'm chasing them. Yes. I don't so, think through all so of these options. You're absolutely right, but we have to start to teach our children and ourselves, especially in our harried and crazy society we're in a little bit where everything's rushed, how to stop and think in the moment. Steve, we heard not too long ago about the young man who went and chased after his cell phone. Right. And what happened to him? He got killed. He got killed. So in that moment, thought was a good plan, but was it a good plan? No. So we need to teach our children how to stop and think, especially in the moment, because it's in that moment where we always make the wrong mm. choice. What's the significance of separating boys and girls into different groups? So great question. In 1985, when we started the program, we actually used to put boys and girls together. Mm. Now what ended up happening is the majority of the referrals, 70% were boys and 25% or 30% were girls or 75% boys and 25% girls. So we always had to wait till another girl was admitted into the program because you, mm. you don't want to put one girl alone with six boys because there's only seven kids in a group at a time. So we knew from the research, having done it for about 10 years with boys and girls, we learned from, because we're very much a scientist practitioner model, where science informs practice and practice informs science. What a novel that, idea. Yeah, you have to make sure what you're doing is working. These kids deserve the best. So what we realized through our research was that the girls were not improving at the same rate the boys were. So for example, I can have a group of boys, and in an hour and a half, we're 15 minutes at the table, 20 minutes doing role plays, um, uh, which is, you know, and then we're out in the gym doing 20 minutes of an in vivo exercise where they get to practice the skill they learned. They come back upstairs, they have galactic congestion, which is snack, and then we do a mindfulness exercise, which is relaxation. And an hour and a half, just like that, it goes quickly. Girls could stay at that table for the whole hour and a half. <laughs> They're more cog, not that boys are not, but they can stay at the table and they could talk and talk and talk. Yes. The boys, I, they'll be under the table or over the table if I keep them there for an hour and a half. So girls and boys obviously are they different. They are different. There different are different. Approaches. There's so many similarities, but very much differences. And so we found through our research we needed to separate boys and girls. And so in 1996, we became a gender specific program where we have the SNAP Girls program and we have a SNAP Boys program. And it works better this way? It works much it better. And the outcomes are excellent. You offer something called the Arson Prevention Program. Why do you need a separate program for pyromaniacs among the kids? Well, the Arson Prevention Program actually first got started at CAMH, so the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, okay. through Dr. Sh uh, Sherry McKay. And so she started that program because fire setting is a very dangerous behavior. So young kids, um, when there's a fire that breaks out, instead of running out of the home, they will hide, right? Mm. And so it is a very dangerous, we call that an episodic behavior like stealing. It happens um, not as frequently unless there's some very chronic issues. And so you need to teach the kids immediate um, strategies to survive. So you get them involved with the fire department. They learn to stop, drop, and roll, for example, mm -hmm. and make sure the home is safe. No candles, no uh, fascination with fire. Um, and if a child is at serious play with fire, you make sure you check you, you'll actually do a check. Make sure there's no matches, no lighters um, on, this, on the child. Are you in favor of parents behind their children's backs going into their bedrooms and checking through dresser drawers you know, and all that? That's a difficult question. But when there's a serious problem, you take serious measures. And absolutely, if my child was at risk of fire play or fire setting or fire interest, I would absolutely do a check before they come in the house and check their backpack and check their things to make sure. And I would not have those kind of things in the home um, that um, that they can get into. Would you do that sneakily or would you tell them you're going to no, be doing No, I would it? absolutely sit them down calmly okay. and tell them this is the plan. I'm worried about you, I love you, I care about you, so this will be the plan going forward. From this point forward, I'm gonna check just to make sure. I'd love you to tell me, but I need to as your parent. Um, as a parent, we try to be our kids' best friends, mm -hmm. and sometimes you can't. Doesn't, you have to be a parent first. I hear you. Does, does, um, doesn't that just encourage them to hide their arsonist tendency somewhere else to hide the matches outside under the rock and in the we, backyard? Yeah, it's a great, we've, we've, we've had that, where yeah. they actually had. So it's just being very uh, uh, diligent and vigilant mm. in the sense that you're just making sure that your child's safe and your family's safe. Let's do this in our last minute. How, yeah. how can you tell whether you're succeeding? 
Well, because we do outcome. I said we're a scientist practitioner model. Every child and family that enters our program, they complete standardized measures, first and foremost for treatment planning purposes, so we know how to build a good treatment plan for them. And then secondly, for outcome and research evaluation. And so we look at pre-treatment, where they're at, and we look at uh, six months from entering treatment where they're at to determine level of risk and need. We uh, use our risk assessment tools that we developed called the Early Assessment Risk List that actually determines which risk factors in mm -hmm. child and family that we need to be looking at and what protective and strength-based um, um, factors that we can build on. Okay, but the hard thing here is if you're successful, nothing will happen. Right? If you're unsuccessful, right. they're going to make fires, they're going right. to steal, they're going right. to hit, whatever. If you're successful, nothing, none of those things happen. So how do you tell, again, if the outcome is nothing, that you're winning? So there's been a lot of randomized control trials where you actually randomly a kids, assign kids to either SNAP or treatment as usual, and SNAP outperformed treatment as usual on numerous randomized control trials that have been published. Yeah. There's also been a cost-benefit analysis that was done on SNAP by Dr. David Farrington and Chris Kogel, leading criminolog criminologists in the field. They actually found for every dollar you spend in SNAP, your savings on just convictions is $32. It doesn't take into account amount of health, health, uh, education, etc. And what if I told you that same study showed that we can actually reduce crime by 33%. So when I tell you that we know, we know is because we've done long-term randomized trials, we've done long-term follow-ups, and we know that right now we're able to divert anywhere from about six or seven kids out of ten. Hmm. So when you kind of do your cost-benefit, I just have to keep two to three kids out of, the out of the juvenile justice system, out of 63, and the program pays for itself. And we're serving over 63 to 100. But the issue is there's lots of kids that are still waiting. Right. In, a, in Toronto alone, we have about 100 kids. But hopefully through this uh, youth action plan that the Ministry of Children and Youth Services has implemented, um, we're able to re going to be able to respond to kids sooner. Lena, it's good of you to come in tonight and Thank share you. uh, your wisdom on SNAP. And uh, once again, you. happy anniversary in October. Thank you very much. And thanks for having me here to talk Not about this important topic. Lena Ajamiri from the Child Development Institute. Many thanks. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.